Hello, Tabernacle family. Thank you for joining us for another midweek message. And we are starting a new series right now. We've concluded our messages in Ecclesiastes. I know that was greatly impacting for me, and hopefully it was for you as well. And so I thought we'd spend the next uh, several weeks going through the Psalms and just beginning at the first Psalm and continuing from there. I know last year uh, we sort of cherry-picked throughout the Psalter and went through probably a little more than eight of them throughout the course of the year there, uh, which is refreshing to me. I love the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. Uh, and so Psalm 1 is a great place to start. Uh, I was sharing with Jason a little bit earlier today that, may I be sentimental just for a moment, this, this Psalm actually is uh, particularly meaningful to me because this was the first message that I ever preached, and it was terrible. Not the psalm, but me, <laughs> for, for all manner of reasons that you can imagine. Uh, but the Lord laid it on my heart to preach, so I met with one of the associate pastors at our church, and uh, he walked me through this. And so time came. I was a ninth grader, and I got to present to the seventh and eighth grade chapel at my, at my Christian school. And uh, I was supposed to preach for, you know, the whole chapel, like 30 minutes. I, I, my knees were shaking. I might have made it 15 minutes. I don't know. <laughs> so, so that was it. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, it's kind of remained sort of stuck in my heart through the years. And I praise God for that. Uh, it's really a beautiful psalm in a lot of ways. In some ways, it's sort of the prologue for the Psalter and sort of sets everything up. Uh, there is real beautiful parallelism in the Hebrew poetry. You could divide it in couplets, and so you got one, two, three, four, five, six, and each of those sections have parallelism. You could divide it in half, one through three, four, five, six, that's how I'll treat it today. Uh, but just understand, there's there's a rich beauty in the tapestry here, and there's a lot of subtle nuance uh, in the Hebrew. So hopefully I'll bring out some of it, it won't all come through, but I, good Lord willing, will at least come away with a good blessing. Uh, the first verse really sets it out. Blessed is the man. And so this is a psalm about blessedness. It's a psalm about uh, happiness in your life. And you learn certain things about the heart of God. Namely, he, he does enjoy that you would be happy. Think of, think of Psalm 1611. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Sometimes we have this dour and glum Christianity. And that, that's not really the heart of God. Our, our God has joy that just bursts almost explosively from him. It's, it's marvelous. Uh, and that pairs with that subtle and uh, long-term joy that, that we can have. Thank you, Jesus, for all those things. Uh, but also in this psalm, if you go down to verse 6, it talks about the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. And so a great contrast is set up. And so uh, you might think of this as uh, your way of life. And really, at that point, a question for you. Which way will you choose? Uh, and so the first way is the blessed man. If I say that word blessed, uh, think of it Think of it this way. Um, something happens deserving of congratulations. That's blessed. Uh, we're coming up on graduation not too long from now, and so you're going to come up to that graduate. You're going to shake out your hand, stick out your hand, well, or if you're a little more COVID conscious, you'll keep your six-foot distance from them and say something like this. Congratulations! Well, why? Because Something has happened in their life, something significant. Not, you're so lucky, but, but look at the goodness of life. Congratulations. Uh, a new child is born. Congratulations. Uh, someone is getting married, right? These are major events of life. They're congratulatory events. That's what's going on here. Look at this life. It is the most favorable condition. Uh, it is the one, you could translate it this way. Happy is the man. Well, that's great. So God is showing us today, look at this happiness in life, look at this joy in life, look at this congratulatory type of life that might just be yours. Well, don't you want to keep reading? <laughs> Blessed is the man who, and now he goes from there, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. May I present a problem here? before we go on. Because if you look at the mood of the verb in the Hebrew, it's kind of a perfect mood. What, what that means is that you have a certain expectation. Namely, this is something that the blessed man never does. This is someone who is absolutely perfect 
in his avoidance of these things. I'm going to return to that in a moment. But for now, let's describe what it is that he avoids so scrupulously. Uh, the first one, he says, that's who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Now, you probably have noticed the progression in these things, right? And so this first step, because uh, sin is subtle, isn't it? And so typically you doubt before you deny, and that's kind of the way that Satan tempts us right there. This first step has the idea of being influenced. Uh, you are just in the course of your life walking along. Here's somebody else walking along, and their, their counsel begins to weigh on you. And so you are now one who has been influenced by the ideology of the wicked. Their ideas have begun to take root in you, nor stands. Well, that's, that's significant, because now it's not as though you have been walking and you've come in contact with certain ideas. Now it's that you have begun to embrace these ideas. You've gone from one who has been influenced to now one who identifies with. Boy, identity is a really key word. Uh, there is so much to say, but it's a kind of a midweek mini right here, so we're not going to tease out too much. But the idea is that your identity has now become joined with this way of sinners. And now you go from one who has been influenced to one who is identifying with, to this last one, this scorner, this mocker, this scoffer, that same word sometimes gets translated variously depending on which translation you're using. Mockers are missionaries of wickedness. You now have gone from one who has been influenced to an influencer. It's a common word we use today, and you're talking about those who are uh, thought leaders, those who are media influencers. That has now become you. You have been influenced to the degree that you have internalized this wickedness and have become a promoter of that wickedness. And when you talk about that word scoffer, this is one who holds the way of religion, God himself, in derision, just scorn. It's this strident atheism or strident religion of another stripe, uh, maybe progressive Christianity, you might call it in which that which is authentically godlike, the miracles, the inspiration of the word, those standards, those sexual mores and norms that God calls us to are completely disregarded. Isaiah 5, Isaiah 6, woe unto those who call evil good and good evil. And there is a complete transvaluation of which Nietzsche would be proud almost. That's the scorner. Be careful. Now, now we go through this, and uh, it's always easy to think how good we do in these things. But do we? Because I want you to now remember what's going on in the Hebrew here. This is one who has never done that. Now, I ask you, are you influenced? Have you come to identify with certain ideas? Have you even become the one, fools make mock at sin. Have you even become the one who finds yourself laughing along merrily with those whose way is to hell? I'll be honest with you, I can't say that about myself. As I look at my life, I don't have a perfect record on that. Do you? Well, this puts us in a really bad way. Because God say, if, if you want the result, of being happy, this result of living this blessed life, then it is incumbent upon you that you must have a perfect record here. So now, here's a mystery. Who is the Psalm 1 man? Um, is it Abraham, our father? Can't say it's Abraham. Abraham has a spotty track record here. He's a man of faith. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. He is the one with whom the very word love is introduced into the biblical corpus, right there in Genesis 22. Uh, he loved his own son, whom he loved. Uh, but his way with his wife was duplicitous. You can't say that of him. But was it Moses, the lawgiver? Was he the one who is the Psalm 1 man? You can't say that about him. He wrote some of the Psalms, right? The Psalms of Moses. And yet we understand he killed a man. We understand that he tempted the Lord. Remember the waters of uh, where he struck the rock there. Not David. We know about David. Uh, 
God. And David, for all of his goodness, gave us Psalm 16, right? Uh, we, we love this. talks about the way of the righteous man. Also gave us Psalm 32. We'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, so who is this man? Now you know. You know who this man is. This, this is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, think what that means. That means that he, because of this beautiful imputation, has taken our sins upon him. We're the one who is this sinner, scoffer, scorner, wicked. That, that's actually us, not look how good we are in never being there. <laughs> Your heart is duplicitous. And yet, here we are in this way, and Jesus is willing to take our sin upon him, and therefore, in return, imputation still, credit card bank, that we are given the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So when you look at Psalm 1, herein is the mystery of Jesus Christ. And you see the crucified Lord. Who is the Psalm 1 man? It's Jesus Christ, the blessed risen Lord. Hallelujah! Don't you love Psalm 1? And now we get to say, thank you, Lord. And this is the gospel, the good news, that we can be blessed through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And if you have such imputed grace and love and mercy, then verse 2 comes alive for you, is delight. So what's the blessed man like? Well, the blessed man, the one who is most favorable and the condition most desirable, is also this one who delights in the law of the Lord, in Yahweh's Torah. Not just the first five books, Torah, but the teaching, the instruction of the Lord. That your delight, now this is the basis, results in your meditation. That's the consequence. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And because you love God, think about this. Jesus, your robes for mine. This is a grace-based theory of living right here. This is not how we so crassly categorize the whole of the Old Testament sometimes. That's a, that's a bit wrong. Rather, you understand now something about God's grace needed in your life. Therefore, you delight in the Lord. And because your delight is in the Lord, what do you do? You think about it. What's your gaze upon? What is those things that, that you meditate upon? Now, it may be that you meditate upon your idol. That when you go to sleep at night, your mind has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Maybe your mind is all categorized by worry, by anxiety. Now, there's consequences because if you set your mind upon your own strength and upon those things that you can't control, guess what will happen to you? You'll, you'll be a wreck and your thoughts will start to spiral. You'll be up late at night having all that agita. <laughs> Good Italian word for you there. Not so for the righteous person, though. His delight is in the law of the Lord. In that law, he meditates day and night. It's almost like the, uh, the background program in your computer, right? It's just on. It's constantly running. That's, that's it. In fact, that word meditate actually means to mutter, to mumble. It's the idea when you're thinking so hard about something that you're, you're sort of rehearsing it in your mind. Uh, maybe you have a speech coming up and you're sort of muttering your way through it. Why? Because you're intensely thinking about it. Isn't it sad how Satan steals all the words? Like this linguistic theft that comes. It's so sad. So if I say meditate today, you think of a yogi who wants to have you empty your mind. By the way, yoga is a spiritual discipline. Please don't be so ignorant as to think that it's not. And so now you're going to empty your mind. That's not scriptural meditation. And so when, when we hear this word in the Bible, we don't need to give it up. We just need to understand it, that you are deeply thinking about the law of God. Okay, so if you want this blessed life, First, you need to avoid some things. I understand we don't have a perfect track record here, but we also understand that does not uh, recuse us from any sort of responsibility in this matter. So there are certain things you must avoid. Say no. Secondly, there are certain things you must love, like the law of God. If you never are inputting the law of God, if you're never inputting these 66 books of Scripture into your life, it's unreasonable to assume that you will have the peace and the blessing of God in your life. That's just... Uh, not a logical consequence. However, if you are doing these things, look at verse 3. He shall be like a tree. Be a tree. Now we come to the consequence. Now we come to the reward, the result of this way of life. There's a real roadmap that God's laying out for us here. That if you do certain things, like walk in the way of sin, 
you'll get certain results like verses four through six. On the other hand, if you do certain things like the righteous man, certain avoidances, certain uh, saturation with the law of God, there's consequences for this. That you, you embrace the righteousness of Jesus Christ and what happens? You'll be like a tree. That's a good word. And think of how he spells out this metaphor in, in terms of uh, Hebrew poetry is almost indulgent. How many lines are taken up in this stanza as he talks about this tree uh, where there is a rootedness, there is a stability. One who is not blown about by every wind of doctrine, Ephesians 4. One who is not captured and captivated by the spirit of this age, which will change, give it five or ten years, and will be equally loud as the next firebrand and fool comes on the stage. But we are persuaded better things of you, beloved. You will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. In fact, that word in Hebrew means by the divisions of water. The idea is irrigated. You have this dry, arid land of Palestine, and yet a wise gardener who has diverted the streams according to his purposes and planted trees according to his purposes. And this blessed person, that's you, believer in Jesus Christ, is planted according to the will of God by the living water. Well, what does that mean? That means that the place that you are in, in life, that was chosen by God. As he diverted the streams, not every tree gets planted in the same spot. And so in some cases, God has laid out for you a peculiar hardship in terms of your physical needs. This too is the will of God. And for others, he has planted them in a broad place. This too is the will of God. Can, can the pot who is formed say to the potter, how dare you? Do you believe that? If you are looking to your circumstances, your environment, for your flourishing, you will falter. If, on the other hand, you sink your roots deep into the living water, you will be like this irrigated tree who brings forth fruit in its season. There's an ebb and flow to life, isn't there? You know, earlier I mentioned Psalm 16 and Psalm 32. David's the author of both of these. Psalm 16, man, he's, like, he's, he's riding the high life. Talks about, at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I'm always quoting verse 11 there. But the whole, the whole psalm is just beautiful. This is the blessed life. This is the godly man. But then you get to Psalm 32 or Psalm 51. This is after his sin with Uriah, his sin with Bathsheba. Against thee and the only have I sinned. I've done this great wickedness. Now, those are very different seasons of David's life. The one talking about all the goodness of the Lord. The other also talking about the goodness of the Lord. And yet talking about how his bones waxed old through his groaning all the day long, or he says this, may the bones that you have broken rejoice in you, my Lord. Brings forth this fruit in this season. That tells me that in both of these seasons of David's life, and in this case, not sparked by the consequences of sin from others without, but from his own sin within, he was still able, upon repenting, to give God glory in these very different seasons of life. Same thing with you. You can be fruitful right now, where God has planted you. How so? Well, his leaf also does not wither. In fact, whatsoever he does prospers. When I say prospers, that doesn't mean if you open a business, you'll get a million bucks. You know, maybe you will, maybe you won't. Uh, the right to succeed is also the right to fail. <laughs> That's sort of the way our economy works, isn't it? And so maybe your restaurant closed, or maybe it grew threefold this year. The idea here is rather this. When you hear that word prospers, it's that the work that God has given you to do has been accomplished. That's different because this is the work, says Jesus in John 6, that you believe on him. That's a different thing. What if God's purpose is making you holy, not just happy? That's, that's a different type of joy going on right here. So his leaf doesn't wither. In other words, the drought is coming, but you are planted by the irrigated streams. Now, I am uh, maybe enjoying this psalm a little bit too much because I'm halfway through and I'm about 20 minutes in. <laughs> so I'm going to floor it, okay? Forgive me for my uh, lack of balance here. Uh, verses 4 through 6, not so the wicked. That's how you'd literally translate the Hebrew right there. Uh, they're like chaff. And so what we have now really is a series of about five consequences 
Uh, with, with the righteous person, you have a lot more of uh, a pathway. But now it's just, here we go. If you're wicked, this is what's waiting for you. You're like chaff. How different from the tree. And think even in the, in the poetic nuance of this, how many lines describe that tree? We just went down and down and down. Chaff. Like the chaff, the wind blows away. That's it. There's, there's a, a poetic emphasis right here that the wicked are transient. Their place acknowledges them no longer. You might flourish for a moment, but you're done. You want to live the party life. The party's ending. Watch out. You want to live for the primacy of power of middle age. You won't be middle age very long. You want to live for your grandkids. Well, what if they don't visit? You want to live for the respect and community of others. Well, what if they don't call you? You're like chaff. That means that you have set your hope on something other than the life-giving streams that the master irrigator has given for you. So when you are depressed, scratch below the surface and ask, wherein lies your hope? That the wind drives away. Continue reading here. Verse 5, Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. They have no hope of coming out of judgment unscathed or sinners in the congregation of the righteous. This is interesting because this psalm is about the wicked versus the righteous, but there's a, a magnificent poetic delay. You've not even read that word righteous until right now. And here we are, verse 5, about to close out. And while the wicked will most assuredly perish, the righteous are going to have their congregation. Typically, it's been, look at verse 1, all this assembly, all this loud throng of the wicked, and there's just been this one righteous man. But now finally in verse 5, the righteous has a company, a family, the church, the assembly of the righteous. And now the wicked is alone, cast out into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. The wicked will not stand in the judgment. Sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows. That's that word yada. The Lord watches over. Uh, the Lord has intimate knowledge about the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked will perish. This is subtle too. Notice the object and notice the subject. So this is the way, okay? And we're contrasting the way. But first, the Lord knows an object, the way of the righteous. But the subject, the way of the ungodly will perish, or the way of the wicked will perish. This tells me something, that the righteous person is also the one who is being watched over by God. The righteous person is the one who has given up his own independent prerogatives and it is allowing God through the Torah on which he meditates day and night to control, to dictate. He's the one who is spirit-filled. Whereas the wicked person is the subject of his own life. He's the one whose way, he is in the driver's seat. He wants autonomy. He is the one who is saying, has God truly said? He's the one who says, God, I read what you said in the Bible, but I don't think that makes sense for me today. I'm going to do what I want to do that way will perish, will be done, will be vaporized. It's almost the idea uh, of that highway uh, which collapsed over there in Minneapolis, pardon me, uh, I think it was 2007, I-34 West. Uh, and there it was, years and years, I believe the fifth busiest interstate in that major city. And then one day, it collapsed. Hundreds of cars many deaths gone all the way down into the river that's kind of how it works with those who are the subject of their own life guys this is the true path to happiness that you would give up your own independent prerogatives and rather submit to the torah submit to the truth of the one true god